My name is Mark Buchanan. Without Jesus Christ, I would be all alone in the world and forever. Where would I be without your love? Where would I be without your grace? Father in heaven above, all of my sins you erased. You saved me from my life of misery and rewrote my history. This is my story, and to you be the honor and glory, y'all. Resurrected, born again, no longer a slave of this world I'm living in. Broke the chains that held me down, I've been set free, so let me testify. I actually think that at the back of my mind was this idea that if I t entirely trusted God with everything, that he had ruined my life. Uh, I, I think it was just kind of this little shadow at the back of my mind that he, he didn't, God couldn't be trusted enough to completely look after my life, that he would somehow mess it up. and. So that was, I think, a, a deep hesitancy in me. But uh, looking at this couple that would be very much close to, very on the verge of coming to a place of faith, and then the discovery afterward of we were giving nothing up and gaining so much, I would just tell them, get on with it, <laughs> move. <laughs> Mark, you, your story today, is the ongoing journey of being part of, and I quote, what you wanted nothing to do with. In fact, this whole world of religion and spirituality, it, it weirded you out. And, and I'd like you to unpack your story for us, but let's begin with um, this whole idea of religion. Let's talk about uh, church, church for you as a young boy. Any fond memories? None at all. I I only have maybe two or three times I went as a as a child to church because my mother was going through a religious phase where for a short while she got interested in Christianity. I was probably about five. So I have three distinct memories of and she dragged me along. I don't remember if she dragged my brother. I don't know how he got exempted. But I uh was pulled along to a church service. And what I remember is, I remember the droning of the pastor. I remember the lilac, the heady lilac perfume of the large woman sitting in front of us. And these things uh, just added to the strangeness of this religious experience. Um, I I'll ask about mom in a moment, but, but tell us about your dad and religion. Yeah, no interest at all. And I think uh, that's partly what I absor absorbed is his uh, indifference and if push belligerence toward religion. So he had zero interest, but if somebody brought up the subject with him, he would tw quickly turn surly about it. And so that had a, a, a huge impression on me. He also, uh, around the time I started become, coming, sort of have memories, he uh, got sober through AA. He was quite a fall down drunk up to that point. And of course he had to deal with the God of my understanding, but he basically made AA the God of his understanding. Did you ever find out why dad hated religion? I never did. Uh, it's sort of uh, both my parents, a lot of their family of origin remained quite sort of um, kind of unknown world to me. My mom's I got to know a little bit later, but I, I, I do think that somewhere along the line he had um, uh, uh, someone in his family line who is quite religious in a way that was off-putting to him. Now, Mom, you've mentioned her uniquely. She she was different. Yeah. When it comes to religion. Yeah, very much. How so? Well, she was hungry. She was curious, and uh, except for this brief spell where she dragged me off to church when I was four or five, 
it was mostly uh, she got interested in Eastern mysticism, not particular Eastern religion. So it wasn't any particular Eastern religion. It was Eastern spirituality. So swamis, gurus, yogis. Um, she was quite fascinated for a while with a, a yogi who was a breatharian, claimed that he took no nourishment except from the air. So she had a profound fascination in, in all of that. And uh, that's my most vivid memory of kind of her religious affections. As I, as, you know, my childhood went on, is the biographies of these swamis that she'd read, uh, groups where she would get together with other, mostly women, to have conversations about that. And, now, um, it, it kind of ties in with you, but mom eventually comes to Jesus. That's right. How did that happen? So when I was uh, early teens, my mom started following the uh, uh, Maharishi Mahash Yogi who founded Transcendental Meditation, and she was a very deep devotee of that. Um, and around that time, I became friends with a guy from school. We just moved to another city from where we'd been and uh, became friends with this guy whose parents were Christian. They thought he was, but but wasn't the case. And uh, But they were deeply concerned, uh, his mother particularly, about my influence on, on their son. And so they sent, sort of dispatched a couple of women to my, my house uh, under the guise that they're going door to door, but they were just targeting my house and my mom. So she just wanted to argue with them. And so they had a vigorous argument and asked if they could come back the next week. And they had a vigorous argument the second week. The third week they asked her if she'd like to come to a Bible study. And I think she just thought, you know, giddy up, let's, let's go and we can argue with a whole bunch of them. And uh, two weeks later she came to Christ. And it was the strangest thing for my brother and I, and at the time I just chalked it up, another guru. She found another guru. You lose mom to Jesus. It, totally. What, yeah. what about your brother? We're both uh, f feeling that something's happened to mom, we don't know what, and we don't, you know, she's gone away basically. And my dad entrenches more deeply in his antagonism toward all, all things religious and especially Christianity. But my brother goes for reasons um, related to just stuff going on in his life. He goes into a pretty pr profound depression. And indeed, my mother's worried that maybe this won't end well. And she talks him into going to the youth group at the church she's attending. And he's so bereft of, you know, any hope he says, why not? So, so off he goes. And to my astonishment, my bewilderment, within two weeks, he's come to faith in Christ. And now I've lost my brother. And this is a, this is a great loss because we're partners in crime and we've, he's 18 months older. We're, uh, uh, we'd love to ski. We go up to ski. We, we, we can, we're just, we're very creative cursors. We can swear like, uh, you know, like we've been working on, on the, the construction crew forever, whatever, and all of this just falls away from him right away. So I've, not only has he got, gone down the rabbit hole, my mom did, but I, I don't know who he is. I don't recognize him. Now, so, so mom, you lose to Jesus, your brother, you yeah. lose to Jesus. So against all odds, your turn's next. And, and the storyline yeah. in this is is incredible. So just breaking it apart, um, and it's relative to your brother. Yeah. Because your journey all begins with what you called a stupid gift. <laughs> Explain what you meant by that. There's a Bible. Um, I, right after all of this stuff happens with my mom and my brother, I moved in with my girlfriend. I was 18. I... I, I felt deeply alienated from not only the two of them, but, but from the faith that they had embraced. And so I just went and did my own thing. I really threw in common a lot with my dad, at least in a, at an emotional level. It wasn't like we sat around and talked about it, but I felt his, his, his animosity toward this faith. 
that Christmas, my brother buys this girl that I'm living with my me Bibles for Christmas, and I'm like, oh, you could have got me a case of beer. Like, what a stupid gift. And I put it on the shelf and forgot about it. And and then I this relationship was was so messy and I had no wisdom I had no skill at navigating it I did not know what to do and I thought I should see if there's anything in that book that could advise me I thought it was a sort of a book of uh, answers to life's dilemmas or something so I cracked it and stuff started to happen when you say stuff, <laughs> what do you mean? Well, initially, so I, at the same time, I'm pursuing a, a degree in university in literature. So I start where well, you should start a book at the beginning. I start in Genesis. And if you've never, I've never read the Bible at all. I've never cracked it open up to this point. Genesis is a weird and fascinating book. And as a piece of literature, it's utterly captivating. So I'm reading, thinking, hmm, this has got all the sort of makings of a great story. But hit Exodus and then into the other stuff, and it's like, this is dreadful. This is so boring. So I did phone my mom, and I said, I didn't tell my brother I was reading the Bible, but I phoned my mom and said, you know, I'm reading your book. And uh, it was interesting, but now it's not. This stuff in Deuteronomy, I don't think I even pronounce the right numbers. Like, like, what do you get out of this? And she said, oh, no, you got to read the Gospels. I had no idea what that was. So she explains to me, it starts, you know, way down past the middle of the book, start there. So it didn't make no sense, but I picked it up. What happened then is the book started talking back. Uh, I, in all my days, Robert, I have never experienced then up till now a book sort of messing with me, getting in my face, uh, in a, in a deed, um, insisting on a conversation with me. And I've read some of the greatest works of literature and certainly they've had a tremendous influence on my life, but this was like the book was talking, and I would tremble. I would just tremble. And I felt that, that at a very visceral, personal level that Jesus was speaking to me, the Bible was speaking back, that it was talking, and Jesus was incarnate in this word and was asking me, as he asked so many in the Gospels and especially in Mark, would you follow me? And to me, this was not a question of history. This was a question of the moment. It was a question directly to me. So what I found is not, I did find the wisdom later for living, but what I went looking for and what I found, two different things. Well, it, interesting, um, you, you this is going on, you're, you're having this conversation with the Bible and it's talking back to you. Um, but it causes you then to make some changes. And so you had mentioned that you had uh, broken up with your girlfriend at that time. Yeah. You met another girl, Cheryl, who eventually becomes your wife. But as all this is going on, you also want to start this relationship with mm -hmm. Cheryl. But before you do, she has to understand something about you, Mark. Right. What was that? Well, I, at this point, have not made any commitment to Christ. I just know that it's coming down to a reckoning. So I, I confess to her that I very much like her and would be interested in a relationship, but I forewarn her that I'm on this spiritual journey and that I may end up, and I use the term that was popular in that era, a born-again Christian. And she says to me, oh, I'm a Christian. Now, I'd been going to parties. Uh, we worked together, Cheryl and I, and I had seen her at these parties. And so I said to her, this is, I'm still a little pagan. 
I said to her, honey, you are no Christian. <laughs> uh, uh, she says, her next line is, uh, do you mean if I died tonight, I'd go to hell? And this is the greatest pickup line ever. Yes, she would. <laughs> it, it, so she's startled. And she actually says, well, I want to find out about this Christianity too. Really, the first time I spoke to her about my interest in things in Christianity and Christ, she was wide-eyed and was quite, quite eager to, to pursue this. In fact, I was kind of slowing her down. And in some ways, I, I feel that I've been just spending the rest of our marriage. Now, nearly 40 years now, I'm catching up with her. She's really a woman of great faith and great prayer. So this change, you mentioned the term becoming born again. Yeah. How did that happen then for Mark? Several months go on, we're attending church, and it's a very evangelistic church. It's a pastor, I can't, I don't think one Sunday he let go by where he didn't make, um, you know, a, an offer or appeal to put your trust in Christ. And this is getting powerfully uncomfortable for both of us, uh, where Cheryl's sort of temperament is she's not going to make a move until I'm ready to make a move, but she's ready to make the move. So I'm feeling pressure from her, but certainly from this pastor. And Every Sunday, it seems like he's bearing down on me personally. I think that he's devised his whole sermon just to kind of, you know, put his finger on that sore spot and press hard. He preaches one Sunday. This is probably seven months into going to church, so I don't know how I endured the weight of all of that. And he preaches on this text in Revelation chapter 3, Laodicea, uh, where you know, one of the churches that, that John, uh, who writes that, the evangelist John, um, and Jesus is speaking to this church, and he says, you know, I wish you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, and I want to literally vomit you out. And the pastor, like, he, he, I mean, he goes all in. <laughs> He's like, some of you here are, you know, lukewarm. He's just vomitocious or whatever. He's just, he's, he's really laying, laying on the image and, and uh, putting on the pressure. And I'm, both Cheryl and I are shell-shocked. It's like, that's us. We've, we're, we're lukewarm. We're not hot or cold. We, we sort of got so far and quit. But we don't make a commitment. He, he puts out the call and we don't walk the aisle. But we were really shaken, and we go back to my little apartment, and uh, we talk about it the whole day. And finally, we said, "We gotta do this. We gotta do this." And we get down on our knees, and we just pray a simple prayer. We'd heard the pastor lead people through enough that we knew the language. Jesus, I'm sorry, for taking so long. I'm sorry for the ways I resisted you and fought you and not believed you. We do now. We do now. At that moment, did, did you sense a change inwardly? That well, you know, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the skies opening and doves descending, but it was powerful because I realized, and we actually were quite candid with each other, my greatest reluctance is I knew this was an all-in thing. I knew that from the minute I started reading the Gospels. It was all in. There was no, there was no halfway Christianity. And there was some stuff, uh, there was some carnal pleasures, let us say, that I did not want to forsake. I wanted to enjoy those. And I knew I had to lay it all on the line. And that's what I was holding on to. And the minute we got on our knees and we prayed that prayer. The best I, I can compare it to is like I was clinging to a little stale cheese sandwich. I just didn't want to let that thing go in case I got hungry. And the minute we prayed that prayer, it was like the banqueting table of God's feast opened up before us. And thing, I mean, I, I, I couldn't get rid of the, the cheese sandwich. 
church fast enough that God had opened up all kinds of things that had been sort of kept from us up to that point, including we, we, we had longed to be in some kind of ministry. We, that was the thing that we thought, if, if God would entrust us with some form of ministry, we had no training, <laughs> but we just thought uh, that would be the great prize. But we knew that until we actually made a full on commitment, that wasn't gonna happen. So that would have been the moment you would have said, I'm born again. It, I, that's the, thing, the very phrase I use that next Sunday when I went to the pastor and I said, by the way, just to let you know, your sermon did have an effect. And last week after the sermon, my wife or my girlfriend and I became born again. Mark, I, I've got one final question for you. Um, if someone is watching and listening to you tell your story and they have this thing against um, the pure and undefiled religion that the Bible speaks of, or a phrase that you had said to me earlier, and I'm quoting, the God with whom I have to do. Um, if someone is struggling with that, what would you tell them? If you're pursuing religion, then you're actually going down the wrong path. That never ends well. If you're pursuing Christ, then you meet a person and you make a choice. It's a, it is a crisis. It is a, a moment of reckoning whether I'm, you're going to trust that person with everything you have, everything you are. But that's a very different thing than saying, I'm going to pursue a religion and try to understand all the philosophy, all of the, all of, all of the implications of that religion. I would just say, find Christ, and then all that you need to know will be worked out from that place, how you should live, how you should think, what you should do about fill in the blank. I would just go after Christ. If you've been listening to Mark tell his story and it's moved your heart and you would like someone to pray with or you would like to know what it means or how to become born again, please call our 24-7 prayer line at 1-866-273-4444. If you want to learn more about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it can transform your life, you can request a free Bible by calling toll-free 1-888-482-4253. You can begin your journey with Christ now.